the world of black sci-fi and fantasy culture, and also of the multimedia series Rayla 2212, uh, about Rayla and Matt Filmatic, a rebel strategist and third generation citizen of Planet Hope. Um, in the middle here, we have Wale Oye Jide. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Wale is uh, the designer and creator of the fashion brand Carrie Jones, as well as a writer, a former attorney, and recording artist and producer. And all the way on the far right is uh, <laughs> 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 um, is uh, Michael G. Bennett. He's an associate professor at Arizona State University School. Uh, for the Future of Innovation in Society, the Center of Science and the Imagination, and the Risk Innovation Lab, as well as lecturer in the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. So uh, to kick this off, uh, Natasha, since you wrote an entire book uh, about Afrofuturism and kind of the history of it, uh, I would love if you could kind of let the audience know, everyone watching, kind of give an overview of what it's about, and um, also tell us a little bit about how you came to Afrofuturism. Sure. Uh, for one, thank you for inviting me here today. I'm really enthusiastic. Uh, Afrofuturism is a way of looking at possible futures or alternate realities um, through a black cultural lens. It's the intersection of black culture, technology, the imagination, liberation, and I always add mysticism. It differs from traditional science fiction. One, in that it bridges, it views the, the future, the past and the present as one. It really engages the feminine aspect of consciousness and looks at intuition and feelings as a, a source of knowledge that's as valuable as, say, the way you're thinking. And it is a, it also addresses or looks at race as a technology. Uh, that's a term that's frequently used. Uh, there's a lot of engagement around nature as well. And it's highly intersectional. So it, it's seamless and has a it's very fluid uh, perspective that's very nonlinear. So I think that a lot of people see themselves in that way, is. And in your book you, you describe like kind of the trinity within Afrofuturism. Right. Who are those folks? Well yes, yeah, so there was like a foundation of sorts to this pyramid. Um, you would reference Octavia Butler, you would reference a sub rock, and then a George Clinton, you can't really get around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so can you talk a little bit about like 
how you found yourself within Afrofuturism, um, because it seems like a very personal sort of getting into the, the movement, sort of, because of a personal, not a decision, but you have to kind of create that space. That's a big part of it, is like creating space to get to that. So how did you come to that? Well, I think it, for a lot of people, it begins with a question, and then over time, you discover the answer, you know, with most things. And for me, with Afrofuturism, I discovered that I was always an Afrofuturist and I just did not know the term or didn't know the prism through which to really look at it. As a kid, I loved science, I loved history, um, but, you know, history and science aren't supposed to be within you to emerge, right? Uh, you're supposed to be a math person and a science person, you're supposed to be a reading person. So, you know, there's a lot of judgments around that. But ultimately, when I went to college at Clark Atlanta University, I met someone who was talking about what we now call Afrofuturism. And over time, I really met a lot of people who were engaged with these ideas where they were looking at sound and the imagination and technology and music and culture. They wanted to see themselves in the future. They wanted to claim their relationship to science uh, from a cultural perspective in terms of those who contributed in the past or overlooked and really wanted to engage these ideas for self-liberation, for social change, and felt that it could be very transformative. So as I discovered more people who were very much engaged in this, I, I started to find the term Afrofuturism, and that really helped narrow my focus. Um, it's very much, a, I would say, a journey of self-discovery. It kind of takes hold of you like that. Uh, much like the music that we call Afrofuturism, you know, the vibrations just get to you and you're like, oh yeah, where am I? Well, I would say <laughs> Afrofuturism is very much that same place. Um, Michael, you, one of the places you work is the science of imagination. What does that mean? And, it, and how does that apply to like your use and um, experience with Afrofuturism? Because Afrofuturism, it's a lot of it is about imagination and thinking outside of the box. And I'm curious how that like, applies to you and your work. So the, this is really a direct I whisper um, all the time. It's got to be in my mouth if it's in the closest. Is, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the Center for Science and the Imagination, and now today is you going to the, the first part of your question. It's really focused on you know, a series of projects, a range of projects, really, but they all kind of come around to this notion that um, there's still a lot of work to be done at this intersection of science and science communication with the, with the public, various publics, as well as um, uh, back and forth, more back and forth, more interaction, more transmission, traffic, and whatever you want to call it, between conventional science communities and aesthetic or artistic communities. And so to put some, um, some legs on that to make that a bit more concrete, um, one of the central programs, the focal programs um, that's uh, underway at CSI, as we call it, out of ASU right now, um, is concerned with the upcoming yeah, bicentennial of um, Frankenstein, the novel. And so a series of um, publicly facing engagements that range in terms of actors participating in it, that range from museums to practicing scientists to uh, social scientists to lawyers like myself, um, are all gathering around this, uh, this novel, and more importantly, the central concepts behind it to explore what it might actually mean to do innovative and practically by definition controversial work in scientific realms in the present and future. As far as my, um, my own engagement with Afrofuturism, um, in some ways it parallels what's happening now at um, at CSI. There have been um, a series of movements, a series of works, including um, um, uh, Lennox and Lennox here, that have been really critical to me. Um, folks who, upon initial uh, discovery of them, I didn't um, immediately associate with them with Afrofuturism, perhaps because um, the term had not um, Emerged yet, but um, Samuel Delaney, of course, is a major figure for Afrofuturists, and personally, along with probably uh, comic books from the 1980s and the Bible, the only reason that I can read these days from 90s, his writings have been so profound for me. It's through him 
I finished right there, just that I came across and continue to come across most of the figures that are central to the aesthetic political point of want to call it. Wale, you're, you do a ton of stuff. Uh, you have Kiri Jones, your, your fashion line uh, for menswear. You also have um, an exhibition. Is it, a, it's Our Africa, correct? Yeah, Africa 2880. It's basically a ongoing series we're working on that kind of depicts African cities 100 years in the future. Yeah, so I don't, there, I think there were some, yeah, there were some images um, in the other room uh, up there, but. But just to describe it a little bit, there, it's a series of digital digital images, yes. and um, each one is a different uh, city within uh, from a country in Africa. And you are you are in it, and also yeah, it's other a people. super narcissistic. But <laughs> for anyone who does fashion, if you ever see Kanye West, this is this is us. Yes, um, it's very it's about, it's about us first and foremost. But for me, it was the idea that. Uh, all of what we do, and I think at the base level, we do all this here is storytelling in some form or the other. So for any of us who ever watched Star Trek or Star Wars or anything with people with funny ears in it as a kid, many of us saw ourselves, or hoped to see ourselves on the screen. And so it's natural when you go on to tell stories of your own, you're going to eject pieces of your heritage, pieces of your culture, pieces of yourself into it. So for me, ultimately, if I'm telling stories and, and folk tales about my people, we're going to end up representing the way we look and the way we feel. So when I thought to convey images of different places in Africa to huge content with numerous different continents, sorry, cultures and countries, uh, it was very natural to say, well, well what would the place of cities like Lagos and Nairobi look like in the future, as opposed to thinking about kind of the stereotypical view of the future that you see on television. It tends to not reflect a wide variety of cultures, even though they say they do on the base level, it's not as broad as it can be. Yeah, and those, uh, your images, they, there's, um, I think in at least most of them, there's hovering kind of like uh, drones and, and space aircraft. Right. Um, and y you have um, text underneath them as well. Yes. Um, let's see. For the whole, like for the entire thing at the beginning before the, the actual, and you can find them on his website, um, he writes, the following is an ongoing series of stories that scrutinize aspects of present-day African society and attempt to telegraph their ripple effects in the far-flung future. Um, which I feel like in many ways encapsulates kind of what Afrofuturism is about, which is um, kind of, and many people have said this, it's taking bits from the future, bits from the past, bits from the present. And I just, could you tease out a little more like sure. your background and kind of how you sort of came across that within the work. I think generally when you think of science fiction, it tends to be allegorical in nature. So if you think about Star Trek and Star Wars, these are the biggest examples. They're stories about you know these cultures a long time ago in the galaxy far away or far in the future, but they're ultimately telling stories about us. So you watch Star Trek and you have the first interracial kiss on national television, but that's allowed to happen because it's oh it's a futuristic land, but it allows us to kind of relate to each other on a personal level in real life. So for me, oftentimes, when you flip through the newspapers, on the rare occasions that they cover the continent of Africa, it tends to be doom, gloom, grisly, in nature. You have your, your kidnappings, your oil theft, your terrorist attacks, and much of these things do happen, they do exist. But a lot of my work is intended to kind of convey a more full picture of life, not only on the continent, but specifically Nigeria, which is where I'm from. So when I tell these stories, whether they be in the of nature or shot into the future. It's always the idea of kind of telling what's happening now, but with a wider scope, with a more human scope. So even when there's brutality, sickness, and violence, you're still getting it from the perspective of real people with actual emotions and connections. You're not getting these like faceless from people who are disposable uses puff points. You're not getting a story about the first black kid who dies in the film because he's there. You're getting an idea that if he dies first, get a family and cry about it. So that's Ultimately, we're using stories as a vehicle to kind of tell you about us and who we are in a more full, complete sense. Um, so, Afrofuturism has pretty much existed for a very long time. So, I'm curious if there's anything you can kind of notice. I mean, there could be other factors as well, it's just like time. 
happens and history happens, but like, is there like a very marked difference between before Afrofuturism and what's Afrofuturism after? Well, I can say a, one of the reasons I wrote the book Afrofuturism was because a lot of people were engaging with these ideas, but they felt like they were very much alone. They were by themselves. They felt isolated. Um, they were, you know, them and a friend, and they're talking about metaphysics, you know, under a rock somewhere. And they felt as if they shared these with the larger public or larger black culture, that there would be this mass rejection. Uh, so it was just this concept that people couldn't connect with themselves. Uh, that's why I wrote the book. But when I look back to the time when Afrofuturism, the, the term emerged, I think for many people engaged with those ideas, it was a way of sharing and, and trying to, to wrap their mind around some of these concepts and really develop language around it. So when you look at uh, Dr. Alondra Nelson, who put together the first Afrofuturism Wister, and a lot of their early writings, you know, with Greg Tate and others, they were really they were really trying to synergize and to find a language to articulate how these different concepts intersected. Because you have to think about it. You're talking about, you're looking at music, um, te techno culture, then you're trying to mash that with uh, actual science, and you're trying to connect that to you know, history or the contributions that Africans and, and indigenous cultures have made to technology, and then you're trying to loop that back to the future. I mean, so it can feel as if you're all over the map. And I remember when I spoke with my friend in college who was talking about what we now call Afrofuturism, my first question was, well, what is this? I said, what is your foundation? What is this philosophy? Because I came up in a new thought metaphysics tradition, which is very foundational, if you ever pay much attention to it. So I'm like, okay, so Nate, give me a scholar. Give me a, a philosophy, a point of view. And he couldn't name one. Uh, now, he was familiar with other kinds of metaphysics and various terminologies, but when it came to identifying Afrofuturism, he didn't know that word. And so, for some people, they don't always have the courage to kind of fight the fight and step out there and be the lone wolf and, and talk about these subjects publicly. They can feel a little rejected, but once there's this it's established that, look, no, there's a, a community, but beyond there being a community, there's a lineage, there's a history of it, and you can you connect with all of these people in the past who engage with these same ideas. For people of color in particular, it's very empowering to feel like they're not alone, and that this perspective is rooted in the, rooted in our understanding of humanity, and very much rooted in our own culture. So, in a strictly uh, calendar-based sense, I'd say there's, uh, there's certainly um, several differences, uh, like a before and after the coining of the term, um, several, several different um, uh, dimensions of change um, within what we recognize as Afrofuturism. Um, but one of the most important um, of them, and it's the only one that I'll mention just so I don't hog up too much time here, is that uh, I think that the, um, the concepts, the fundamental concepts behind the, um, the term have become um, much more relevant. Um, in the early and mid-90s, I certainly thought probably once a week that I was living in a science fictional um, environment, just random, random stuff happening in the world. And that rate, um, the rate at which I sense that now is probably five times a day. <laughs> well, can, it, can we uh, expand a little bit about that? Because I, I do think it is important to kind of discuss how we can like, apply this to today and how it sure. manifests itself in everything that's happening. Right? Sure, sure. So I, I wouldn't be so bold as to, to try and define Afrofuturism, but I will, I am bold enough to, to say that I'm um, comfortable saying it there functional aspects of it, the things that many of the, the artworks, the activities, the individuals that we associate with the term, that many of them wind up doing. And one of those things is um, characterizing various aspects of um, black subjectivity, or the history of um, black folk in this country or around the world, 
as fundamentally a science fiction novel. So a, a classic way in which that's done is to say, um, take a, a kind of radical revisionist history perspective on the Atlantic slave trade, and to say that in addition to the conventional um, interpretation of it as being this um, economic and ultimately, obviously, fundamentally racist kind of event, um, you can also understand it as a, a kind of an alien abduction, right? And to, to run with the with this metaphor of alien abduction and kind of open up two science fictional concepts, two science fictional neologisms, um, two science fictional tropes of various types, many aspects of um, contemporary black existence. And so that that honestly is a um, a really personal. Uh, personally attractive um, aspect of Afrofuturism. It's one that, as I said a moment ago, it's one that I felt pretty regularly before I had any idea what the term meant. And again, it's one that I, I feel with increasing frequency now when we look around at the state of the world, whether we're talking about assaults on the biosphere, whether we're talking about uh, police brutality, which is uh, a chronic issue these days, or gun violence, I and mean, by the way, I'm speaking about violence to all the people out there in live stream land, um, folks in Paris, folks in San Bernardino, folks in Chicago, folks in Staten Island. Um, um, thoughts, um, good wishes and vibes go out to. Um, I wish I could say more than that. But um, coming back to the main point, um, many aspects of what's going on now um, oftentimes get captured under this uh, this term of, term of the, um, the Anthropocene, right? Um, especially um, ecological damage and the, the assault in the biosphere. Um, and then the fundamental notion there being that um, humans now are having such a profound impact on the, the globe, on the planet, that in the same way that we might talk about the Jurassic Age which is being one dominated by reptiles, we can now talk about this period that we're in being dominated by human activities. But um, to, to run with the science fictional um, theme just a bit further, I would say for those of us that are interested and in various ways committed to Afrofuturist thought, that we might call it a Cthulhu scene, really. It's a, a fundamentally horrific, for, for many, many folks that are black in this country and around the world, it's a fundamentally horrific um, period and has been for a long time. And I think that's why I like the imagination part of Afrofuturism because it's about using that imagination to transform your circumstances, to be able to see something beyond what happens to be in front of you, and therefore connect with that, and almost traject yourself into that experience by seeing it first, and moving past a certain projected reality. Just to, just to chime in on that, I'm sorry, just to chime in on that, um, a piece that should be appended to what I just said is that, um, as Mark Sinker, who wrote Afrofuturistically before Derry did, even by a few years, as he has suggested. One of the things that's so interesting about um, black American approaches to, as I called it, the Cthulhu scene, is that um, there's a, a radically, um, almost tragically visionary approach to the apocalypse, right? It's not defeatist. Um, Sinker says that, uh, in effect, the vast bulk of black culture um, is post-apocalyptic, but only by necessity. It's as a result of what's happened, and it moves on from that in a strange kind of way, again, um, tragically visionary way, and embraces apocalypse because there is no choice, really. You have, to, you have to apply your imagination to create new things, given the stripping away of everything that mattered after a certain point. Uh, well, so from the an African perspective, much of the, the stories and things that we told of the continent of Africa um, to the Western world have a very stark, particular picture about it. You, you say the word African, people immediately convey certain images, by and large, they tend to be negative. So, what we do in storytelling, whether it be present day or in, in the African futuristic theme, is the idea of kind of reclaiming your narrative and telling these stories so that people won't tell them to you before you and telling these stories so that you can then have a basis to live your life for towards. So instead of having somebody in Hollywood telling you Africa is like 
what it would be like. You then have people who are from there, who live there, who understand it, who can have convey what they believe things will go forward. So that we're basically reclaiming the image of what has become forced upon us by people who are not familiar with who we are. I'm curious, I mean, this is a few years uh, back, <clears throat> but what did you think of um, District 9 in terms of, did you see District 9? Yes, uh, so awesome film, pretty problematic depictions of Nigerians. <laughs> um, so that stands out to me because I am one. Uh, really attractive looking film. So, this is kind of a different point, but um, Beast of No Nation just came out, this is Idris Elba's film, um, by Kerry Fukunaga. And I'm sure it's amazing, because I love his work on True Detective and some other. Um, I just didn't have interest in seeing it, because in, uh, I heard this from a lot of different Africans as well, it's just they did, that we have this fatigue of suffering. So, while there, it is true that there is a degree of like, negativity and, and, and violence, and I'm sure it's pretty close to true to accurate, at a certain point you just get tired of seeing people needlessly slaughter each other without much else. So that's it, I haven't seen the film, so it's not fair to me, fair to me completely tied it. But there's a degree of like, I have seen it. So I know that people felt similar about Soul vs. Slave without having seen it, and so it, it kind of made me, like I, I saw it on this one the film, uh, but it kind of, when Beast of Nation came out, it made me realize that there's a certain such as the population just kind of get the tired of seeing their people being brutally insulted and in art. Regardless of the nearest how great the story is, it's a whole story. You know, I was thinking too, when it comes to Afrofuturism, I think one of the things that excites people about it is that it triggers the sense of agency, right? And your ability to tell a story, um, but also your ability to, to really connect to a narrative that's not dystopian. You know, oftentimes the way black the black cultural narrative is shared is that it's kind of this this ongoing struggle of sorts, um, and, and there's a truth to that. There's there's total truth to that. But I think another perspective is looking at the incredible resilience, and out of that resilience comes a, a strength, a sense of optimism that then gives you a level of agency. And so you know, there's kind of this realism that's always placed upon us when it comes to our storytelling. As if we're supposed to talk about a specific thing in a specific way, and if you don't have this kind of horrid arc to it, then you are not adequately capturing the the story of our cultures. Um, but when you step into the creative world and the the realm of the imagination, not to mention things that have actually happened, you can create your own story. So there's just this concept that our imaginations can be hijacked because as people of African descent, we're supposed to tell a particular kind of narrative when we can dream of anything we want to dream of and have a sense of agency in our real world, but as well as in our own creative lives. And it's that creativity that has helped us to transform our experiences and facilitate a level of, uh, forget survival, but flourishing in unusual times for, for quite some time. It, it seems like um, uh, people of color, especially black people, that's a lot of the art, whether it's Afrofuturism or not. It's the idea of like hope and um, not focusing, or maybe not not focusing, but not dwelling too much on the struggle. So, how is that like? How is that Afrofuturism? different, say, than something that is not, that is equally as like hopeful and, and sort of resilient. Um, example, Kendrick Lamar's All Right, like that's a very powerful, hopeful, resilient song that I wouldn't classify it as Afrofuturism. Is it just solely the, tech, the technology aspect or the, the science fiction aspect or is there, is there more than that that kind of separates it's the science fiction aspect, but I think it, Afrofuturism takes it to space. It takes it, in some cases, to the supernatural, and they become flip sides of the same point. So it doesn't have to be purely rooted in the here and now, um, where there's a, a sense of limitation in the three-dimensional realm. So, that, and so there's always this understanding that there's more than the three-dimensional realm, and whether you're talking about uh, the physicality of actually being in space, 
or you're talking about, you know, just other worlds, generally speaking. Um, there's always this interconnection to that sense of self and this larger identity. So you aren't just a human being. You can be a, um, you know, you're a universal uh, being that's in a three-dimensional space. And, and so Afrofuturism constantly reminds us of that. Whereas other narratives that may talk about hope and aspiration, that's not what they're sitting in. Um, so, I'm curious as to you um, in, encountered Afrofuturism in college, correct? Or you became aware that it was. Actually, I didn't. I heard the, Afro, the term Afrofuturism um, really more in recent years. I, mean, I don't remember hearing the term in college where it actually stuck. Okay, let's put it that way. And did you guys also kind of encounter it in adulthood or were you younger when you? I remember using the term uh, on an EP I put out years ago without knowing where it came from. So it's, I think it's one of those things that just kind of floats in the back of your head. And it's like, these words sound awesome together. Why are you not? You know, it's a juxtaposition that you're not used to seeing. So it's, it's attractive. It has. It sounds cool, and it makes people curious because um, it is. So I think there's one of those things that's been floating around for a while. It's just it makes sense. Okay. I I asked this question um, because I I'm interested in knowing how like is it is outer futures in sort of like a. a movement or a concept that is accessible to everyone regardless of like what their education is, what their background is. Because a lot of it is like resiliency and hope. And I feel like if a lot of people if they are not as educated, if they are living in poverty, it might be more difficult for them to access that part of their imagination and wanting to like find that space and create that space. And you guys are Within that, is is it a mixture of different types of people within Afrofuturism and embrace it? Um, I find that people, generally speaking, regardless of background, it's just a matter of what you reference as a connecting point. You know, if you say, you know, George Clinton, if you mention Octavia Butler, if you say Janelle Monae, if you say a John Coltrane, you know, some people access it very much through music, and they know exactly what you're talking about without having to use any um, special language to give a big description. I found that many people, uh, it, it's interesting because sometimes we talk about Afrofuturism like it's this um, higher thought process as if only educated people can discuss it, when it very much is rooted within so many people and they express it and they connect with it um, very easily. You know, it's, you don't need to spell it out because it's it's in their soul, it's a part of their imagination, it's a part of their experience. So we're using certain terminology to to really codify it. But in terms of people connecting with it, they know exactly what you're talking about. They've experienced that level of transformation, you know, that level of liberation, sometimes through music or through dance or through contemplation. Um, they see themselves as being larger than the spaces that they're in. And when it's shared that, hey, you know, this is something we can talk about publicly, they're game. You'd be totally surprised about who connects and why they connect. And you just ask them the right question, and, and they're more knowledgeable than anyone you could imagine. Because it's, it's just a matter of asking the right question. It seems to me that, um, as is the case with so many final artistic modes, I guess, is one way to describe um, some of the things that happen it's under the auspice of Afrofuturism. But so many um, um, activities in that, that category, there's a, a wide spectrum of application, right? So well, perhaps someone who is struggling to put food on the table on a weekly or daily basis might not be reading the, the theoretical writings of someone like Cowboy Shoe. Maybe they are, maybe they're not, but um, maybe they are seeing the, um, the video for Missy Elliott's new relatively new um, WTF video, which is, for my money, um, profoundly Afrofuturistically tinged. 
and you can get a, a hyper-compressed sense of at least some of the things that we're talking about here by seeing um, a music video, by hearing um, certain uh, recordings of music, maybe even by hearing um, very short poems. If someone is really skilled, maybe even just by reading a tweet. By the way, I hope you're, you're tweeting. <laughs> So I, I've learned very quickly, like, even years ago with making music, the idea of owning what you create is futile and the fool's errand. So you make something, you put it out into the world, you have no control over who you shape it, nor should you. So when you have a genre, like whether it be Afrofuturism, whether it be hip hop, you're going to make it, and whoever feels like connects to it is who connects to it. And you ultimately have no right, or I, I believe you have no right to say, like, you can't relate to that because you didn't experience it the same way I did, or you didn't grow up the way I did, or you didn't look the way I did. So for me, it's ultimately, it's almost just like opening this whole new hallway to a library that everyone is free to access, and that most people didn't know was there. So in a sense, I see people like us as gatekeepers or people who are in front of the doorway saying like, look, there are other stories for you to check out, and they're just as, as full and complete and diverse as all of those that you've been supposed to perform. So it's just kind of opening the spectrum to, like, to life experience through the as well. Um, we've mentioned Star Wars a couple times here. Um, we've also talked a little bit about how um, one aspect of Afrofuturism is um, the body, the black body being sort of an alien, um, a not of this planet, the other. And, um, since Lupita Nyong'o has been cast in Star Wars, there's been a bit of a sort of controversy. Some people are kind of upset at the fact that she's playing an alien in the first place, because like, she's a, I think she's the only main black female character in the movie that we know of, and she's, first of all, she's gorgeous, and she's gonna be motion capture, so I'm really gonna see her face. So a lot of people are upset about that. I'm curious because part of Afrofuturism is kind of embracing the alien claiming it, what do you guys think of people being upset about this and are you here for that? <laughs> <laughs> no. I have to say the movie. I can't talk about it without saying it. Um, but yeah. do you, but do you think do you think people are jumping the gun in terms of you know her her representation in the movie? Like you are like a wait and see type of person. You don't Right. I, I'm kinda wait and see but I, I do understand that people are, they get very excited about representation, you know, as we should, because that's sort of the holy grail, right? I want to see images of people on the continent of African descent in the future. I want to see that image, right? I don't want it implied, I don't want to see a metaphor about like you had an alien and then I'm supposed to say, oh, that's my story. <laughs> uh, I want to actually see people who look like me because why should I not, you know? So it's the whole idea that people are, this, this concept, it's not a concept, it's a reality, you know, an attempt to erase people from the future. So you're erased from the past, you're erased from the future, and then you're sort of hovering in the here and now, waiting for someone to write a story, and you know, with your complexion in it. So, you know, that, I, I don't like that lack of agency, right, at, at all. So I understand how important representation is, and I just have to give a little shameless plug. I am doing a movie called Bar Star City, which I wrote and directed, which I am writing, and, uh, or excuse me, I have written, and will direct, and I'm shooting that project, you know, early next year. And it's about engaging stories of people of color that are in the future or in the here and now, very spaced out, and all of that, and showing just how easily we connect to a lot of these concepts. And it was very intentional, and most of the people are people of African descent, and that was done so because that means something to people. You know, it communicates a message. So I understand why people would be critical. We all do, you know. Um, there's other projects we can name where they put, you know, masks on people, and you know, pull the hair back so we can tell, you know, so just all this, this cover. Isn't Predator sort of like a, 
he has a dread, like they look like dreads, but you know, weird. Like, 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 so this is a black guy. But, like, I am they love him. <laughs> yeah, I haven't thought about that either. I mean, but just look at it. I mean, I, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but. <laughs> I know, but it's just it's these little things that we look at. We're like, oh, Darth Vader. We love Darth Vader. Why? Was Denzel Jones underneath, and he had a black exterior. I mean, really, that's what you're holding on to here, sorry. I love it because he choked people in the distance. <laughs> that's a useful skill. So I think, um, we live in a culture of a perpetual needless outrage. Um, people, literally every day, there's something to be like very upset about. And I think that there's oftentimes some justification, but my perspective on that is to do exactly what you did. Is if you're upset about not seeing the painting, make a film. Um, we live in, in, in the culture of like everybody's phone can record, YouTube is there. Um, I would walk into what Ralph Lawrence and not see things that represented me, so I started a mentor. Um, I'm not by any means like a huge success, but it's the idea that literally anyone in this room can create what they want to see in the world. So instead of being mad about J.J. Abrams or George Lucas or George R. Pink, so it's horrible. Write your story and make your film. If we all do that, there won't be much to complain about. Wait, so I'm not sure we, we have to see the, the film because, in a sense, to respond to your question, because in a sense, we've already seen it, right? I mean, this is the same kind of response that um, at least a certain slice of the, um, the viewing population, largely people of color, had the majority arrived. Um, why do you have this person who is um, disabled in a certain kind of way? Um, many of the comments were the same thing with Michael Dorn as Worf, right? Why does the basically the coolest character on the, the program have to be hidden behind all of this wrinkly stuff on his forehead and right, receiving hairline and so forth? Um, it's say it's a perennial kind of critique that I don't want to um, I don't want to dismiss out of hand um, because identity politics are first of all they're, they're linguistically serious and they need to be taken seriously. But I do think oftentimes that that kind of angle, that kind of critique of science fiction, it's, it can be a bit too serious, right? It can be a bit too serious. Again, this is pop culture. It's American pop culture as well, so your expectations need to be adjusted, in my opinion, downward, usually. <laughs> and then there's, um, there are instances of these types of, um, these types of moments that are just hilarious, right? So the reboot of Battlestar Galactica. I thought it was hilarious what they did with the um, with the doctor, the black uh, the black doctor, who is um, people know by a show of hands the reboot. So um, yeah, so that was talking about it, it, it's back and gone again, right? So now I guess ten years. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So ten years or so ago, a reboot of it. Um, and um, long story short, there are a bunch of clones that are Cylons now, and there are a limited number of them, right? And they are, um, in some ways, quasi immortal. Whenever they're killed, their consciousness uploads to a giant ship in space, and another version of their, their selves um, pops out. Essentially, their physical bodies are uh, stored in large numbers, each, each one of these instances of Cylon, stored in large numbers on the ship, waiting to be uploaded with a consciousness whenever the one that's walking around is killed. And there's one that's, um, that's black, right? Uh, and he's a doctor, and he just gets killed over and over and over again. And it seems- Like the part of the storyline or something? It's, it's almost it's like a joke. Like device? Exactly, exactly. So, whereas with Red Shirt and the original Star Trek series, the black dude can only be killed once, right? And then you get upset. This dude just gets killed over and over and over again. And, 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 and it's- And you kept reading, is what you said. Oh, I kept watching. Yeah, and I still watch. You should too. So, <laughs> so um, I think we're gonna open it up
to questions from the audience. Racism in Afrofuturism, where the black experience and black, I guess, subjectivity is placed at the center. I asked because earlier this week, Siri was in the news because she was asked to define the word bitch. And one of the definitions was parentheses black slave and parentheses a woman. And so we discovered our AI is heteropatriarchal and our future is racist. <laughs> So I was wondering if you if you guys could speak to that at all, um, you know, given you know again the centering of the black experience, but also this notion of racism as uh, a topic to be explored, and not just in an allegorical sense, but as a visceral reality. Yeah, I think that's a, a big aspect of a lot of the Afrofuturist works. Um, when I was talking about Afrofuturism differing from traditional science fiction and in many ways. One of those four ways is in looking at race as this technology. And with it being a technology, it's this deconstruction of otherness, or it's this narrative of this post-apocalyptic story and, and kind of framing things in that way to be able to step outside of it. Because I think one of the things that makes, one of the many things that makes racism a little tough is that we see it as something that's always existed forever and ever when the whole notion of even being black or white were created to justify the transatlantic slave trade. So these categorization systems, these, the, the power balance that emerged from that that we've been breaking out of did not always exist. And so when you talk about race as a technology, and it's a constant reminder of that. And there are other sociological frameworks that people use to talk about race. But for me, when you say it's a technology, it instantly reminds me that it's created. It was created for a specific reason. If it was created for a reason, it's a technology that can be dismantled. And when you look at it in that way, I think uh, it, it can be very transformative. But yeah, there are a number of works that, you know, visual art, music, literature that explores it in that way, but just as race, as critical race theory, you have a number of essays that really hone in on, on that thought concept. Hi. Do you, especially to the Nigerian gentleman, do you see a role of Yoruba Orisha culture as a blueprint to our Afrofuturism in certain terms of artwork and writing and, and just basic thought? I see it as an opportunity to, so all of us come from different cultures, each of these cultures has its own like long lineage of myth myths, and so with, with the respect from it just being an untapped resource, so people who are either of Yoruba and Nigerian descent know about this, so people who are just kind of plugged into that background know about it, but for me it's just a whole new avenue of storytelling, a whole new mythos to, to, to for lack of a better term, to exploit and to tell stories about. I think that's never a bad thing. And there's actually a short that's out where the Orishas are superheroes and a comic book mm -hmm. as well. I thought that this has been really fascinating. Um, I'm curious, considering uh, African American culture in particular in America and how religious it is, how Christian it tends to be, what role religion plays in Afro uh, futurism? Well, I could say that the mysticism is a big aspect of, of Afrofuturism. So there's a lot of conversation where people are either looking, talking about spirituality, generally speaking, or they're referencing a lot of uh, African traditional religions or African-derived religions, uh, a lot of native aspects of spirituality and kinds of looking at it, and Christianity as well, and Islam and so forth, and kind of looking at perspectives that connect people to a higher sense of self. Uh, and there's, so there's a lot of, you'll see a lot of spirituality in Afrofuturist writings, which also makes it very different from traditional science fiction, because spirituality of that larger sense of self is not always openly integrated. But you'll see it in probably almost in the majority of works some level of spirituality. One of the most interesting um, ways in which I see um, really theological concepts at play in Afrofuturist thought goes again to um, apocalypse, 
this is a really interesting kind of tension and traffic between a, uh, a kind of conventional or traditional Judeo-Christian notion that is wrapped up with um, revelations and by the stories towards the end of the New Testament, um, more or less apocalypse in the catastrophic sense, the world is destroyed, um, it's the end of time, etc. Uh, the tension between that and then um, apocalypse in the, the etymological sense, um, because if you look at the history of the construction of the word, it, um, it's really going towards an indication and a time in which things transform so much, so radically, that after, um, after whatever happens, happens, um, there's a deep need for a complete readjustment, a completely new set of eyes are needed, a deep sense of what academics might call um, uh, interpretational necessity arrives. And in that kind of space, um, I think it becomes really kind of interesting. And that's something that um, Samuel Delaney talks about at length. Hello, hi. Um, great panel, and you just talked about how race is a technology, right? So I think of racism in terms of like a very new technology, you and I, like, and as a software developer, I kind of see it coming out waves, like, okay, racism 1.0, racism 2.0, 3.0. So how can Afrofuturism futurism sort of phase it out finally? Because software has a death period usually when finally a new technology takes form. So, racism and technology, can you see Afrofuturism as also being a technology that can phase racism out? So, I think, I on that one. I think what we need to kind of keep in mind is just human nature is, is will, and always kind of be what it is. So, before colonialism and in the present day, in my country specifically, there were divisions amongst the people there. Like, Nigeria as a, con as a country was put together by the English and was a forced situation where numerous different ethnicities were forced to become country, essentially. So, you can imagine just like the, the, uh, the negative feelings that arise when you're forced to become neighbors and share resources with somebody who is like a mortal enemy of yours beyond the skin color. It's about, like, I don't like you as what you are. So, when you speak of racism, that's absolutely a reality and a constant uh, technology, if you will, that we need to work on. But as human beings, we will always find a reason to divide each other. And that's kind of the question that we need to, to look at. I mean, if you take it a step further, people who do the most violence against each other tend to be people who are within proximity and people who look like each other. So oftentimes, although racism is, is a horrible ill that plagues America, it's not the sole thing that haunts us, it's us. This is um, a bit of a follow-up to the religion question, perhaps, in that, I mean, certainly the aesthetic element of Sun Ra's foundational <laughs> role in Afrofuturism is, is pretty much beyond question. But I'm wondering how much attention has been paid from like the theoretical standpoint uh, the, to, to sort of like specifically his utopian vision, which does have like very strong spiritual and political and activist dimensions to it. Once you actually like look at what he was saying while he was playing the book of the music. Sure, there's been a number of workshops and more recently a conference. It was at the University of Chicago that specifically centered around Sun Ra and the mythology uh, around resistance, cultural resistance. And Thomas Stanley was one of the speakers there. He wrote a, a autobiography, a book on Sun Ra. And he talked about Sun Ra as being very much apolitical in the sense that he, things, the actions that he took may have been viewed in the context of politics, but he was apolitical in that he was very much about universalism and celebrating the, your cosmic identity. And everyone has a cosmic identity and wanting to really hyperlink people to that state of existence. So Sun Ra is more now than ever viewed in the context as a philosopher. He always was, but now it's being actively discussed. And there, there are a series of, if you're interested in um, the theoretical and, com and conceptual dimensions of Sun Ra and theorization around Sun Ra, there are a series of interesting pieces, including um, 
dissertations that have been written in the last five years or so that I can point you towards after we finish up. I have a question back there. Um, so I think classism is, I think we kind of touched on um, this a little bit earlier, but classism, you know, within um, black culture is something that plagues the community very often. And it's something that we rarely talk about when we discuss how the black community should be moving forward. Does Afro Afrofuturism touch upon that in any way? Um, the division between the educated black man and woman um, and the, the young women in the project, etc. Is that a, a topic that's ever touched upon in Afrofuturism? Well, I think because it's very much about universalism, there's an anti-racism, anti-classism, anti-sexism, anti-anything that doesn't allow people to express themselves. And so, but I can't think of a work that specifically <coughs> deals with classism from an intercultural perspective, which doesn't mean there's not one that, that it doesn't exist. I just can't think of one. So I think a part, another partial answer is that um, you could certainly make links between some of the, the fundamental works that are associated with Afrofuturism and class analysis in one way or another. And one that comes to mind immediately, or multiple ones that come to mind immediately, are the, the science fictional stories that W.E.B. Du Bois wrote. Because as soon as you are on that terrain, then not only are you talking about very um, kind of uh, butter notions that we associate with Du Boisian thought and double consciousness, you're also on the, the terrain of the talented tenth, right? And so there's a, an acknowledgement of class fracturing and the black community right, through this concept, but also a kind of um, social political mandate there to act on it and a moral um, obligation is indicated there too, right? Because he's often uh, talking about the responsibilities of black folk and the, the upper echelons. But, uh, but yeah, I'm kind of struggling to, to think of a word that addresses right. it directly. Right, not great, not class specifically in a cultural context. Like I can think of class, well, in my book, Rayla 2212, when you look at the formation of this new planet that was a, a former Earth satellite, class emerges despite the fact that it was utopian and people didn't want to have class. So race doesn't exist as we understand it today. But there is this idea of well, who was here first and you know who were the original architects. And, and, and then, so there's a sense of class that emerges out of that. And I think that kind of goes back to your human nature point that you had mentioned before about there being a desire among some people to always want to try to create some sense of separation. So um, that concludes our conversation, but you guys can actually join us uh, in the other room.